Hello guys, welcome to the 1804. Um, I'd just like to apologize in advance for the audio. Um, I realized it was uh, double layered after I recorded it. Um, so apologies in advance. Uh, bear with me. Um, we won't have that issue next episode. Thank you and have a good day. say Afro-American, uh, they think only of the Negroes in the United States, but they don't realize that two-thirds of Brazil uh, are, consist of people of African blood, which means they're also Afro-American because Brazil is in South America. And in all of these, uh, many of these countries in South America and Central America, and even in Canada, uh, they are heavily populated with people whose ancestors came from Africa. So when you total up the number of Afro-Americans, real Afro-Americans, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, there are perhaps a hundred million. And if these people ever unite among themselves, not only is it necessary for the Afro-Americans in the United States to be organized, but, uh, but it's also necessary for the Afro-Americans in the Caribbean, or the, the Afro-Cubans, uh, the Afro-Brazilians. It's, it's necessary for all of them to be organized. And then once they are organized in each place, we have to organize among ourselves so that the Afro-American in the United States will be uh, working uh, in conjunction in a coordinated program with those who are in Cuba and those in Brazil and those in Venezuela and those throughout the Caribbean and Haiti and in the West Indian Islands. And in this way, we actually get strength. And it's not an accident that there's no organization existing in the Western Hemisphere that's designed toward that end. It would be, the, one of the, would be a direct threat to imperialism as it really exists and, and to colonialism as it exists in the West. Hello everyone. Welcome to the sixth episode of the 1804. I'm your host Andy. Um, today we'll be looking at a few uh, videos from the past historians of Haiti talking about gang culture. Um, there's a few other sanctions imposed on um, Haitian elite and gang members. And as well as, um, we'll take a look at the attempted coup in Peru. So let me start here. This is uh, Michel Soukar. So if you're not familiar with Michel Soukar, he is a historian, author, and uh, journalist. Um, this is during a, an older interview. He's talking about the gang culture in Haiti and when, at least to his opinion, when it did start, which was under um, the jean bertrand Aristide regime. Um, back in 1995. Um, for those of you not familiar, um, at the time in 1991, uh, Jean-Baptiste still was the first democratically elected president in uh, Haiti's history. Um, removed twice um, by coup d'etat with, um, well, it's going to confirm now, um, at least the first time with CIA, CIA involvement in infiltration in the Haitian army. And in 2004, with the help of um, some members of the core group, but mainly um, the help of Canada and France. So this is uh, Michel Fusuka talking about um, a 1995 speech um, that Jean-Bertrand Aristide gave concerning that. And um, it's in Creole, but I will translate. Uh, I'll translate for you. So here we go. This is what you que ce soit après Duvalier dans le régime militaire, oui, il y a gagné des structures que l'État a créé officiellement. So, he's just basically saying that the state of Haiti had structures that they had created so they can kind of impose this uh, gang culture, but more, um, the real goal was to have this some, uh, some sort of control as well. Que l'État a contrôlé s'acter les macoutes, après ça s'acter les attachés. Maintenant, le la mesure une croisée. En 1995. So this is also during the time that they had dissolved um, Bertrand Aristide, Jean Bertrand Aristide, and his government had dissolved the army. A lot of main reason too why people, well, 
not the main reason, but one of the reasons why he would, they would dissolve an army because most of the times there was a coup attempt in Haiti or there was even assassination, um, a successful assassination attempt. Um, most times the army was involved in it too, which makes sense. That's in most, um, at least to my knowledge, that's in most um, coup d'etats. Moi, personnellement, je pense ça. Quand je dis, il y a une scène qui passe dans la télévision de Vinté, où elle me dit, ah, pays entravé. Parce qu'on message qui lance là, côté chef de l'État pays, a dit que dorénavant, l'État pourra fonctionner, il pourra prendre arrête dans main des structures, des réseaux carrément criminels. So this he's referring to now, the same the speech I'm talking about, that he's about to talk about the message, but he's referring to a, a speech that Jean Beltran State gave, and basically the context of the speech was saying how things are going to function from now on. C'est le jour que moi, Jean Beltran Aristide, campé, et puis il m'a dit un policier qui était le Christine Jeune pour le à collade avec un chef gang so this Jean Beltran Aristide had asked this former police chief, um, Christine Jean, to uh, to give accolades to this at the time this uh, gang member in Haiti. So this is the president of Haiti asking a police chief to kind of make amends um, with this uh, gang member. This gang member was based in Cité Soleil, um, called Commandant Titi. Et puis, le policier a rappelé le président à l'autre. C'est une scène terrible. Un policier a rappelé le président à l'autre pour dire non, ce sont des bandits liés. So, allegedly, the police, this is a lady, she said no, um, due to main thing, he's a, he's a gang member, he's a bandit. C'est pour commencer par remettre des amis, prendre sanction après ça. Elle paye la société, ça lui, ma balle l'homme. So basically, he said the first step to even make amends would, for, would be for the gang. So the police chief, who's officer at the time, had said for the gang member to make amends would be for him to bring back um, all the arms um, that he's been using. And then the state would have to sanction him and then he'd have to go through proper proceeding on um, a trial and proceedings. Then she said that the police would then maybe, or the state would make amends with him. But not before. Aristide Gadil, c'est Madame ça, joue un cadavre, violenté, déchiqueté, tout au son pile fatra. So he's just saying a couple days later, that same lady that made this statement in front of Jean Bertrand Aristide during the speech was found two days later, body naked, in a pile of, uh, in a pile of trash. Et puis le sable, ça a été clair, c'est que l'État, ça, le gouvernement, ça a été là, l'État pas chita sur des réseaux criminels. À partir de ça, ça a été basé. Puisque le message, ça a lancé, que c'est l'autre secteur politique, que c'est affairiste, pour défendre les terres, il a fait même pas, il a fait réseau pas. Et puis... So, basically stating how now... Um, not that this started the gang co um, culture, but in Haiti, by the same time now, since that time, he has, he's had noticed um, one more politicians um, creating, which is not, it's, it's, an, it's not a secret anymore, but creating their own, forming their own gains, either to gain um, some type of political power or maintain some type of power um, over people as well. And also, um, there's always business interests involved too. Hey, yeah, boy. Et puis, il vient nous dans la phase que tu es là. Chaque nègre se utilise les relations, utilise les réseaux pour faire des armes entrer, pour faire munitions entrer. Et puis. Le so, le vidéo ends there, but he's basically saying that they use, which is nègre, not a secret anymore, but they, um, these politicians and businessmen use their relations and resources to make um, guns go in and out of Haiti. So, um, same thing with ammunition too, which is why there's always. You're always seeing these type of um, uh, proxy wars between uh, uh, rival gang, um, rival gangs members of Haiti, and there's no really real basis as to why they're fighting, other than they're not from the same gang, or um, they're obviously trying to have control of a certain area, mainly um, in Port-au-Prince, kind of control or dominate a certain area. 
of the city. So I found it um, very interesting too, because even from the standpoint of Jean Valjean who did, who compared to most, uh, I'd say at least to most um, former Haitian presidents, he's actually, he was more of an, uh, a, nas- a nationalist in the sense that although he might have been corrupt, there's another story even showing that he had um, raised a million or 1.5 million for charity. And then that money was gone, like never seen. It was for, from the state. It was a state uh, program, but that money was um, was not found. And he was responsible for it, too. So there's stories like that um, float around the Internet in terms of um, corruption allegations. Even Jean uh, Julien Moise has some as well, which is another person I'd call another uh, very uh, nationalist, too. But back to Aristide, it's just it's um, it's. Um, very not telling, but it's interesting to see in the um, in the sense that he's regarded by a lot of Haitians as one of the best presidents. Even when there were rumors um, of him coming back, there was some popular support by former um, party supporters for uh, Famille Lavalas. That's who, um, his his party that he founded back in uh, nineteen ninety one or eighty or eighty nine or ninety during his first presidential campaign, but. There was a lot of support for um for him, but this again just to show that doesn't matter um how good you may be perceived, a lot of these politicians either corrupt or have done something in their past that's uh been deemed corrupt. Um this story about Jean Bertrand Aristide having gangs, it's nothing new. However, this specific story about two days later this police officer being found dead um and naked um in a pile of trash. It's very telling because to me, um, there's no way, at least there's no, I have no proof of this, obviously, but there's no way that he was not aware or of that situation or aware, at least, that something may or might have been, uh, would have happened to her after saying that um, statement. So, so the second story I want to get to, it's actually a, oh, I'll share this after, but it's an article from the Miami Herald. Um, it's called Made in Miami, but they're basically following the story of um, the assassination of um, Julian Moise that was back in um, 20, um, 2021. But one of the things you'll see um, compared to, they, they, um, they bring out more details than there were before and have some interesting pictures as to what went down and how it happened. Um, but let me start here by sh- showing you. So. From Miami Herald, written by Jacqueline Shaw. I recommend all of you go to, um, read it if you can. It is behind a paywall, but you can check it out here for now if you want. Um, but let me get started here. So the mission that led to the assassination of Moyes in a politically volatile Haiti involved a cast of shadowy characters connected in some ways to Christian Emmanuel Sano, 64, a fixture for more than two decades in South Florida, where he once filed for bankruptcy. His bogus claims of U.S. government backing were among many lies. So I skipped a part of the article, but what, um, what you're seeing here, there was claims that the assassination attempt had backing from the U.S. government, and he was claiming that as well. But there's no proof of that as of now. Um, then there is James Solage, 37 a maintenance director who quit his job in April 2021 at a Ritzy Lantana, Florida Area Senior Living Center to work for one of the dual security firms aligned with Sano's efforts. Solage, who had signed up for the Counter-Terrorist Unit Security, or CTU, told people that the company had contract with a U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince looking into the issuance of visas. It was a lie. Then there is Joseph Vincent. So all these names just for people that are listening on DSPs. This is just um, the names of the suspects. There's more than 60, well, at least 50 suspects in the assassination attempt which I want to use. These are a few names that the article is highlighting. Um, then there is Joseph Vincent, 57. An ex-DEA informant and like Solage, a Haitian-American, he was once arrested and charged with filing false information on a U.S. passport application. Moving to Haiti seven months before the attack, he was in contact with several suspects, including police officer accused of driving Colombian commandos to the president's house on the night of July 7th. When I tell you this, 
when I look at the stories, I've been following this since the day of the assassination. I can I can honestly say when I read every time I read things um revolving this assassination, it always looks like to me probably one of the most unorganized um cool it's a, it, it it worked in the sense that it did work but it looks so unorganized there's so many loose ends that even from the initial reportings within a week that came out there was already like substantial evidence that former party members or current party members of the phdk um were in, were involved as well there's a word a lot of a lot of i'd say in my opinion there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen in a sense to make this happen but they're just it just left too many loose ends because a lot of the suspects now you'll see them um they're under which the article will highlight too but they're under u.s custody and this was after the fact they were um in hiding too phone records examined by the miami herald show vincent's phone making calls to the office of foreign affairs chairman gregory meeks and member andy levin so these are democrats from the state of new jersey and the state of michigan as the plotting unfolded the pros, the two representatives were among a group of U.S. lawmakers calling for Moya's removal from office. Aides to Meeks and Levin said they have no records of any communication. Um, so it was two U.S. lawmakers um, that were asking at the time for the removal of Ruben Moyes. Why were they asking for his removal? Um, there's no clear indication. However, they weren't the only ones um, asking for his removal, mainly because Based on the Constitution, based, they were saying that Jovenel Moïse's term ended in February 2021, but he was saying it ends by the end of the year due to the main reason of the, the year um, he took uh, power. Um, so every Haitian president, um, in terms of term, it's a five-year term. So where in the States, you can do four years at a time, where an eight-year maximum. Uh, where in Canada, you can keep running. It's a four-year term every time. You can call an election early within two years if you want, but usually it's four years at a time and you remain in power until you lose. Um, in Haiti, it's once you're elected, it's five-year max. Um, so it's five-year maximum. And then once you're not, it's somebody else in power, which at the, um, the um, Jovenel Moïse was trying to change the constitution, not to accommodate... Uh, we, I, I, um, there was no indication of trying to accommodate um, the or change the terms of, uh, of presidency, which I'll get to right now. But he was trying to um, push to change the constitution to favor, I think, to have, in my opinion, at least, to be more favor, uh, favorable for, for better changes and to remove any type of stringent grip that is holding the country hostage at the moment. Um, but even for the term, like, in my, just in my opinion, I don't see how even in an eight-year term, I don't see if you have a vision or a plan for a, con uh, a country or in this case, like 11 million people living in Haiti, I don't see how you can have, um, you can accomplish all, all your goals within five years. To me, it's actually almost impossible. Some goals, yeah, but if you have a long-term plan, I think it's almost impossible to bet on five years and think, okay, well, I'm here, um, um, what I'm doing here is is done. Um, so if I was hoping we will never get to know what he's trying to change, but I do really hope to see Haiti when they have like a similar um, a similar system like Canada, in a sense that you serve your four year term or even let's say five year you're voted into the office, and you're as long as you keep you 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 keep getting voted into the um into the office, then you keep uh, maintain power. Now. The problem with that, though, which is and which is one of the main reasons um, it's like that in Haiti, because it wasn't like that before they had changed it. But main reason it's like that is because of corruption and our um, and dictatorship. Like a lot of people in Haiti's culture, people would want will take power and want to and would want to maintain it. How would you maintain it? Well, potentially maybe rig election, um, correction, uh, sorry, elections, uh, corruption. So. Um, there's that side of it as well, but in a sound state where people are not looking to enrich themselves by um, taking political positions, um, I think Canada's system would fit Haiti best in the sense that the the way the terms work, everyone has their political party, and then you, you maintain power as long as you keep getting voted in. That way you can, if you have a 10-year term, well, 
your 10 year plan depends on, okay, well, the population can look at what you did four years and see, well, do I still want this guy in power? Yes or no, then you can go on rather than just capping it at five years. And then once those presidents voted in, you already know in five years, there'll be a different president. So that's just my opinion. Okay. And then there was Sano himself. Months before the assassination, he sought to hire individuals with military experience through CTU to safeguard him in Haiti at a monthly rate of $2,703,000 per commando. A, later, a letter dated May 29th, 2021, was sent to the State Department urging U.S. support for him to preside over a three-year transition in Haiti. So the same month the State Department letter was sent, Sinon chaired the downtown Fort Lauderdale meet meeting, billing it as a Haiti development discussion. So while they were discussing this um, or plotting this assassination or um, kidnapping, which the article does also show that even um, some suspects are saying this was originally supposed to be a kidnapping done in June, which turned to an assassination done on July 7th. So while they were plotting, he basically, this was kind of under the guise of a uh, development, uh, development discussion for Haiti. So it took place at the Tower Club, a hub of the city's business elite, and is a key milepost in Haitian police investigation. Attendees inclu included several of the, those who are either currently wanted by police, already in custody, or have been questioned as part of the par parallel U.S. investigation. That's a picture you'll see here, and it has some of the. Um, I'm gonna zoom in. I can't zoom in here, but it has some of the suspects here. Oh yeah, I can zoom in. I'll show you. So, and this is a PowerPoint made by the Haitian National Police. This is a picture of inside the meeting, where you have James Solage, James Solage, Haitian American, um, Haitian American who's um, who's been arrested. He's in, yeah, he's arrested right now. John Joel Joseph, which, who fled Haiti to Jamaica, and then they found him, the special unit in Jamaica had found him and then waited for U.S. to come um, take, bring him to the United States. You got Christian Emmanuel Sano there in that picture as well. And then the president of the, the, security, uh, the security firm, Walter Ventimilla, as well. So... A Colombian national like the ex-soldier he recruited, Patel, once testified in a cartel case as an FBI informant and was still working for the agency at the time of the assassination. Several sources told the Herald he has not been arrested. The plan, said Ventel and lawyer, was for Worldwide to provide Sino with a loan to be used by Intriago to help with the cost of security. The money would be repaid by Haitian assets secured after Sino became president by what the law lawyer described as a peaceful transition of power so they're asking about the financing itself and the fine where like where the money came from for financing that's always a big question in the case and this story actually was one of the key things um which intrigue who owned this the security firm that hired the colombian mercenaries he brought in walter Ventimilla of uh, miramar is a uh, miramar based worldwide capital lending group to help sign on with the financing so alleged, this, the article is claiming that that's where the money um, uh, really came from. Through the lawyers, and Tomila and Shreya are both denying involvement in assassination. Neither has been arrested, although their offices have been searched by FBI and Homeland Security Investigation. So this is after the fact here. So what I'm going to show you for the people viewing on YouTube. So the Colombian soldiers arrived in Port-au-Prince on June 6th, so a month before um, the assassination. OK, so Moise, who returned from an official overseas trip to Turkey, uh, accompanied by his wife and others, was unaware of what awaited his return to Haiti on June 19, 2021. The plan was aborted when the gateway plane never arrived. Less than 10 days later, on June 28th, Solat traveled back to South Florida from Haiti, bearing a letter dated June 22nd, requesting assistance from Intriago on promising immunity, protection, and security. So this is what was after a failed kidnapping attempt, which apparently a plane was supposed to come in and it never arrived. This is talking about what went down. So across town, Joseph Vincent was in the Labu 23 neighborhood when his phone rang. 
He was at the home controlled by a businessman and convicted cocaine trafficker, Rudolf Dodov Ja. Like I saw he was also a former DA informant. Ja, they had arrested him within a month of the assassination. They found him in the Dominican Republic. Um, arrested. Vincent's caller was Joseph Felix Bazio. So, if you're not familiar with Joseph Felix Bazio, he's one of the prime suspects um, in Haiti as well. Um, even at the time last year, um, which I'll show you the uh, the article, but at the, this is an article from uh, Kane Broadcasting Corporation. But in September, Abiel Henry had fired um, the prosecutor who wanted to charge um, who wanted to charge him in the assassination attempt. And the proof that the prosecutor had was that once that Julian Moise was assassinated, uh, Felix Badio, who was a prime suspect, and in the article in the Miami Herald article also highlights that he was even um, tracking Moise's movement. Um, Bazio called Ariel Henry twice, and Ariel Henry answered. He had the uh, convos twice. And during that time, Ariel Henry was staying at a hotel, El Rancho, in Port-au-Prince. So, literally, right now, the prime minister of Haiti, who is we since we have no president, he is the head of the state. Um, the prime minister, right now, had contact with the prime suspect of the assassination. And yet, the international community... Like the U.S. government, Canadian government, especially um, with the whole core group, is upholding and legitimizing his his power. It's just funny. <laughs> Only in Haiti. So, Vincent's caller was Joseph Felix Baggio, who had been fired from the government's anti-corruption unit in May. So, and again, the same guy that's the prime suspect and still not found. In this assassination attempt, he was fired from the anti-corruption unit in May. Vincent later told the Haitian judge that Bazio called to say Moise was home watching soccer. For months, Bazio had been spying on the president, aided by turncoat agents in Moise's security detail. Oh, yeah, this is very interesting. I recommend you guys to go read it. Um, it has a bit more detail of every... Um, party involves but it clearly shows that it's not just one person um to me it looks like um the entrepreneurs haitian businessmen politicians and oligarchs and all at least all conspired to have this man killed because they were hurting his pockets and how were they hurting his pockets i'll get to um two points but um shortly right here There's one point I want to show you guys as well. So, oh yeah, in the aftermath. So, several sources told the Miami Herald that the amount of money, the amount of stolen money was potentially in the tens of millions of U.S. dollars, but that figure has been disputed, at least by U.S. investigators. So, the money they're referring to is uh, after the, um, the day of the assassination attempt, they went to his room and they were allegedly looking for a list, a certain list, and a sum of money that Journal, um, Journal had had. Some journalists in Haiti um, did claim, and it was really a certain group of people, did claim that the money was about 10 to 12 million US uh, dollars in cash, and it was mainly a money, and this is allegedly, there's no confirmation, but it was money allegedly received from politicians and entrepreneurs so they can move, um, drugs within the the country allegedly the former soldiers who struggled to collect their promise paid during their time in haiti were supposed to take a cut of moise money and then the rest to go to the haitian plotters the haitians were supposed to be a part of a new government a source of knowledge of the colombian investigation told the herald based on a statement from colombians in custody in haiti In an otherwise detailed 124-page investigative report, Haiti National Police say only the attackers stole large sums along with the surveillance system. No further position has been provided by police except that the cash was hauled away in duffel bags, according to some of the Colombian, Colombians interviewed. The money haul was, was raised as a red flag for some Haitian observers who wondered 
why a president would have such a large quantities of money stashed at his home, how he could have acquired it, and specifically whether, um, specifically whether it could have been the fruits of narco trafficking or other illegal activities. But several U.S. law enforcement sources say they're not looking into drug trafficking or the money as part of the probe. Um, so who knows? We'll see here. And And this is one part I want to highlight here that the um, the article highlighted. highlighted. Um, there is nothing to guarantee that a presidential assassination in Haiti cannot happen again. As head of state, Moise had no shortage of political enemies. His chest-thumping, cascade of warring legislation during one-man rule, attacks on the private sector, in fighting and a growing distrust within a PHDK political party over his successor and own personal involvement with corrupt individuals created a perfect storm. So one thing they highlighted here is attacks on the private sector and involvement with corrupt politicians and corrupt individuals. Um, one of these attacks, and I'll show you here, because the Miami, it's another Miami Herald article, and they're referring to um, this attack. Basically, the title is, Haiti wants to reform its energy sector, so police showed up to arrest power providers. So... I'll read the article here, but Haiti has, there's three companies in Haiti that provide, that provides energy to the state. So it's a weird thing. It's, it's, there's a state owned, uh, it's like see, but that state owned, um, energy sector does not provide its own energy. It just uses energy from three private companies and then provides it, um, to Haitians. So this is an article from 2009 at the time. Moise was um, uh, president as well. So, a former Haitian government prosecutor is calling the attempt uh, the attempted arrest of the widow of late Haitian President Reno Pivot and director of independent power provider illegal and harassment. Um, so basically, I'll show you why. Yeah, sorry guys. It goes right here. The whole thing. Legit confirmed that on Saturday. Hooded Haitian National Police officers with <clears throat> the Judicial Police Unit showed up at the home of the late president in search of his widow, Elisabeth de Brosse-Preval, the chief financial officer of um, Sojourner. Police also went to the home of mother of his client, um, Dimitri Vall, Sojourner's vice president and executive director. So all of these people, I just want to get your name, Elisabeth de Brosse-Preval, former wife of corrupt president René Preval, and then Dimitri Volb, who is a known, um, he's, he's actually known uh, corrupt entrepreneur in Haiti. And his name has shown up in discussions of the assassination. And after the fact, too, there's even pictures of him um, with Ja, another, the former DA informant that was arrested in Dominican Republic. And other entrepreneurs that he would, had a meeting um, with, uh, with them as well. Um, Neither de Bois Preval nor Vorb was home, and security guards at the late president's house refused to let the police in. In both instances, DG said police showed up without presence of a judge, and despite lawyers' legal filing in the case, that should have blocked the arrest warrants issued by the chief prosecutor from being, exec uh, from being executed. The legal saga between Sojourner and the Haitian state has raised a number of questions about what is legal and what isn't in Haiti's already dysfunction, no, and usually slowing move the judicial system. It is also raising concern about how far the country's authorities will go to make an arrest to silence political opponents. Give me one second, guys. There's a point that he made. Oh, yeah. So this is the point that, and this is why they're going after um, Sojourner, the, the energy brand. And um, you'll see Moy's criticism, and I'll, I'll give a point on that. So <clears throat> the government, rather than pay Sojourner for fuel as per its contract, oh, wait, sorry, let me start before that. Prior to the legal wrangling, Volb explained that while Sojourner owed $102 million to the government, then governments then paid to carry beef, fuel importer, the government in turn owed Sojourner $204 million. 
The government, rather than pay soldiers for fuel as per its contract, used the credit provided for fuel imports from Venezuela to make fuel available to Sojourner and then deducted that fuel from the gross bill due to the company. After Moise accused Sojourner of overbilling the state and selling blackout in reference to the chronic blackouts that occur in the country, the Haitian state last month abruptly canceled Sojourner's 14-year-old contract managing one of Electricity Daiti's power generation plants in Avaru and Port Prince. Days later, the state filed a criminal complaint accusing Sojourner of overbilling forgery and other crimes. It was the first time Sojourner Liar said the company had ever heard such complaints, even though the government has 15 days under contract to contest each monthly bill. So this is one of the things that Jimena Moise was fighting against, <clears throat> which why I think part of the reason he's not alive today because the powers above him were pissed in a sense that a lot of contracts, uh, a lot of companies had contracts in Haiti where they were overcharging for the job. One example that Julian Moise raised when he was alive was <clears throat> there was one specific U.S. company that had contracts just to build roads, so uh, mainly pay, uh, pavement, and they were overbilling the state um, two to three times more than what the job would usually cost. And then just so Jovenel Moise compared, basically said he compared it and said it doesn't, it, it didn't make sense. So there's a lot of contracts um, in Haiti that basically if there's there's so much um, loose regulations and laws surrounding it that people take advantage, um, take, people take advantage of it. It's the same thing for so, um, Sojourner. Um, he's, he's accusing them of, of while providing, providing poor service. It's like in, in like, if you live in Canada, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's like uh, there's a monopoly on the cell phone service here in Bell and Ro uh, Bell and Rogers. Um, poor service, and even then, those two companies own all the other comp uh, small companies like Fido, Kudo. Um, um, I want to say uh, parts of Freedom uh, Mobile. They all have a monopoly. Oh, Virgin Mobile. So they all have a monopoly. They offer poor service, yet Canadians have high one of the highest um, cell phone bills. Um, in the world so indirectly to that here he's saying there's a bunch of other companies that could have done the job for cheap and haiti right now has a bunch of contracts where the state is paying way more than it you um it, it should be paying to have these contracts um uh, fulfilled and who signed these before well the haiti has a history of corrupt um parties and politicians so it's no surprise that Maybe there was a time where their um, politicians were trying to help out their friends in the private sector. And maybe they gave them a stupid contract that benefited them and made them uh, um, build up, gave them a good relationship or connection with the private sector as well. On the contract, ED is broken down motors, rebuilt by Sojourner, and the new ones are to be turned over to the state at the end of the contract in 2025. Should Haiti opt to cancel beforehand, the contract requires the government to pay Sojourner back of all of its investment plus 15% say attorneys, adding there was no due process in the government's decision. So that's another thing too, like these politicians and these entrepreneurs, and that was my issue with it was a new statement last week when they said there was no due process when George Kali got arrested. They're always trying to highlight the no due process when it never benefits them in the sense that once the, there's, once the state is doing kind of something illegal or out of hand, um, which they shouldn't be doing, but that's the culture in Haiti, right? Because these entrepreneurs do things that are out of hand, but once the state does it, then they're gonna, they want to call out the state for doing things that are illegal. Yes, the state's supposed to be hold the individuals accountable but if you're being real and not naive you can't expect the state with this corrupt state to hold entrepreneurs accountable with the laws in place that they have right so in this sense i think if jovenel Moïse had an influence on that i think he was in on his part trying to do a good thing but seeing that basically um the state was being overbilled for uh, poor services so so yeah, so this was all really from the Miami Herald um, article. I recommend you guys to go um, to go read it. It's very good. Um, so next up here, so more sanctions. 
So the United Kingdom introduced the sanctions against Haiti. So the UK has introduced a sanction regime designed to target criminal actors, gangs, and their finan financiers whose actions are causing instability in Haiti. Pursuant to the Haiti regul sanctions regulations 2022, which enters uh, into force on December 28th, uh, 2022. The restrictive measures consist of financial sections measuring through a targeted asset freeze on designated persons and prohibitions on making funds or economic resources available. Trade sanctions, including restrictions on the trade in military goods and military technology and travel restrictions in respect of designated persons implemented through Section AB of the Immigration Act of 1971. The UK has published an expl explanatory memorandum and guidance of uh, accompanying the regulations. So, the regulations provide that each person of the time being named of the resolution 20, 2063 sanction list is designated person for the purpose of the financial and trade sanctions. So far, only one person, gang leader Jimmy Cherizier, has been designated. Those of you not familiar with Jimmy Jerizi is, he's one of the leaders of the biggest gangs alliance in Haiti. So, in terms of these sanctions, this seems to be like a blanket, um, let me just click here, more of a blanket uh, sanction. Um, there should be probably, um, that's from the UK legislation. There should be probably more to come after December 28th. Um, what does that mean for Haitians? They didn't really name a name, but other than it really affects Jimmy Cherizier, it's honestly, this does little to nothing, honestly, on on the on a bigger scale, in the sense that Jimmy Cherizier it can, already can't leave Haiti. Um, he's based in Haiti, um, unless he has some type of assets in Europe, mainly in the UK, which I doubt it really doesn't do anything here. Um, so I'm assuming there should be more uh, to come after this, but this is more of a blanket. The way that the um, this was presented is more of a blanket sanction. To me, there should be more sanctions to come matching what uh, Canada and the U.S. U.S. has been doing <clears throat> um, the past month or so. So in other news, actually, there was um, a coup in uh, in Peru, uh, Latin America. So this is from Fiorella Isabel. Um, a journalist, well, I'll tell you, I'll show you a tweet. The president of Peru, Pedro Castillo, has been arrested after he tried to dissolve Congress to avoid a coup, but the armed forces turned on him. The coup was led by Keiko Fujimori, his former rival for the presidency and the daughter of dictator Alberto Fujimori. More to come. FYI, Peru has had five presidents in seven years. All so far ended up removed by Congress and in jail. Congress in the country is far too powerful. So, yeah, there's been, so recently there's been a coup um, in Peru. So this Democratic elected president, he was more left-leaning, um, left um, had the support of many uh, Peruvians. But then uh, there was a coup d'etat, which is a common theme in Latin America, and I guess, in, and you could say in most uh, parts of the world, um, Hoping to have a better future or having, um, have, holding the interests of the people rather than oligarchs in power. So it's just funny to me that really um, the coup is led by his former rival for the presidency. And the same person is, is also uh, right-leaning. There's nothing, um, nothing wrong, but there are two political, two different um, political uh, views. But also the former daughter of a dictator. <laughs> so you really can't make this up um, every time. And it's a common theme. Every time that there is someone, um, every time, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean, no matter when, every time there's someone that's in power that has that generally holds the interests of the people, um, oftentimes oligarchs, international communities will try and remove them from power. So again, always, this is my philosophy. And like, you always know there's been a good leader. You always know who the good leader is, in my opinion. Either um, once they've been uh, either assassinated or um, mainly uh, attempted coup d'état, because usually the ones that are bad end up staying, and the one the bad presidents end up staying long in positions of power. 
And this was just an interesting video from the <laughs> kind of made me laugh, but from the Peruvian. So, so this is a tweet. So in Peru, protesters started taking police hostages every time a protester was arrested. So today they met and did a hostage exchange. So for those on YouTube, I have the video. I'll play it here, but you can see that um, the power of the people really in a sense that they were able to actually take uh, hold police officers and Peru hostage in since they were arresting uh, peaceful protesters. I'll just give a video of the exchange. <laughs> Yeah, so interesting. Um, there's definitely gonna be more news coming out of out of this. Um, because right now, even in Peru, the the opposition that's that's responsible for the coup, they've seen growing support opposing what happened. So they've even asked um, <laughs> some journalists uh, based in Peru or even uh, or alluding to the fact that they asked for early elections, um, just because of that reason. So they're trying to um, reduce the support and just get the elections get it over with, so that power remain that president or the the party. Um, who's supposed to come in power stays in power and can maintain the interest of whoever whoever financed or had um, agreed to do this coup. So thank you for tuning in, guys. Um, you can follow me and my the channel at the eighteen oh four official on Twitter. Um, we're digging again. You'll see more content in terms of um, international relations, um, anything uh, based in Latin America or the. Uh, or the Caribbean, and any type of uh, really Asian content or past um, past speeches or I'd say um, key moments in Asian history or even Latin American history as well. So thank you for tuning in, guys, um, and thank you for uh, tuning in every week. I appreciate your support. Have a good day. And